Hello, my former, former LDS empowered family or my empowered former LDS family, whatever you want to call it. I am here with my good friend and an amazing um, trainer and facilitator in heart math. Uh, do you call yourself a trainer, Cindy? I have or? both certifications. So I'm a mentor trainer and I'm a coach mentor. Awesome. In heart math. And yes. the reason that I had Cindy come on, I've known Cindy for about four years now. Would you say four? Yeah, it's been that long already. Yeah, at least that long. And we've done some um, fun times in the ex-Jehovah's Witness community because uh, Cindy was uh, raised in the Jehovah's Witness um, church. And so she has her own amazing story of deconstruction. And um, I'll have her share a little bit of that with you because it's always fascinating as members of the LDS church to be able to hear other people's deconstruction stories because it resonates and it lines up so much with ours. And it just, it's kind of validating to know that we're not the only people who go through this deconstructing pro process. And it, it's interesting to know, um, all the similarities and even some of the differences too. And so I know we've had a lot of conversations about, um, our experience and, and so many, so much of it was the same. Um, but regardless, we have a lot of programs and embedded patterns that we received while we were growing up and, um, ex our experience in the church that is the same and how you release them is the same and great processes and tools are available to us. And so I wanted Cindy to come and share some of those things with us and, um, her wisdom and expertise. And so Cindy can welcome, first of all, thank you. And, um, second of all, could you tell us a little bit about your experience being raised in the Jehovah's witness church? I know we have our little, we have our one minute version and we have our 20 minute version. And if you're new out of the church, it's usually an hour and a half version, right? Um, but can you share like your little five minute version of, of sure. living in the church and then deconstructing? Thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. And yes, we've had some interesting conversations <clears throat> in various locations. And the one thing that is refreshing at this point in my journey is that I can laugh about some of the stuff that really was painful. And I think that's a sign of healing when you can talk about it objectively and even laugh at yourself a little bit and laugh at the differences. But um, the short version for me is that I was pretty much raised as a Jehovah's Witness. My family joined, I was probably about a year and a half or two years old. So basically I had no memory prior to that. And at the age of about 19 or 20, I decided to leave. Um, my father was an elder. Um, I don't know how that compares to the titles of the LDS church, but he was an elder in mm -hmm. our congregation, which meant he was one of the leaders. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom and very devoted. Um, and I have one sister. And um, it was quite challenging growing up in a small town of about 450 people going to high school and elementary school with like 35 kids in your class so I stood out like a sore thumb and my dad also worked at the school as the maintenance man and janitor. So as I started to become a teenager and realizing I didn't want to be in this anymore, I had no refuge. I couldn't Marcus. leave my yeah. school because his <laughs> eyes were always on me. No Anybody kidding. who's watched The Handmaid Tale and they hear about the eyes, <laughs> I had the eyes on me all the time. Um, so that was a little uncomfortable. Uh, when I was 16 and had my driver's license, I finally got a job as a cashier at a grocery store about 20 minutes away from the house. And that's when I started to get my first taste of freedom. Because very much like the LDS, it's all fear-based and mind control. And you are told what to think and how to act and what to say, where you can go, who you can associate with. Everything is scripted for you. So when I chose to leave at the age of 19 or 20, um, I then became disassociated, which means my family and congregation actively did not have a part of my life anymore. I was fully and wholly shunned in all meanings of shun. It wasn't passive. It wasn't if they chose to. It was an immediate cutoff. And it had remained that way to this day. 
So tell me what your relationship is now with your, like you're in your fifties now, what is your relationship with your parents now? Yeah, I have no contact with them. Um, I raised my two children who are now 30 and 32, um, 33. Um, and they have only seen or met my children less than five times. So they've had no interaction with their grandchildren. Um, I now have two grandchildren who they have no relationship with because they haven't had a relationship with either of my children. Um, the toughest thing for me to deal with at the moment is my grandmother who was not a Jehovah's Witness who allowed me to come and stay with her when I left the Jehovah's Witness Church at about the age of 20 or 21. Uh, she kind of replaced my mother's role in my life and we are very close. Um, she knows my children very well and she's very close to my granddaughter. Um, she now lives with my parents because she's 95 and she could no longer be on her own. And so because she now lives with them, I don't get to see her anymore. Oh my goodness. So that is the biggest struggle for me. My children aren't able to go down and visit them, even though they were never Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, my parents are kind of extremists. You know, each religion has the people who are left or right or in the middle. And my parents, yeah. unfortunately, are very, very extreme. So the only contact I have with her right now is an occasional phone call. So that's, that's the biggest challenge for me is, is to wrap my arms around that because that's not her wishes or mine, but because of the control of the Jehovah's witnesses and the narcissism and how far they can take that. Um, that's how that's playing out right now. Oh, gosh, I, that is insane. I don't understand how, how um a person can be so convinced that that alienating and shunning their family is a healthy or even a productive way to get them to to reconsider their faith and that if they really do choose not to be a part of that religion how they can completely cut ties i know um and we probably talked about this how difficult it must be to even have intimate relationships when you're in that community because you are constantly at the risk of losing um, those relationships at any moment, somebody could disaffect or disassociate or, or, um, and, and when that happens, you risk getting uh, called in and having to speak with the elders yourself if you communicate with them. And so, it, right. as, so that's crazy. I, I feel it is crazy. That is one thing I know in, um, in the LDS church, the shunning is covert <laughs> and they say they don't shun. Oh, we still love you and all of these things, but the shunning is covert. And there's um, not only that, there's just a breaking away. You don't have anything in common. It's just a sticky, weird, awkward situation, but the shunning is not incorporated into the doctrine. Um, and so the shunning in the Jehovah's Witnesses is overt <laughs> and it's obvious and it's expected and so I, I just, the dynamics of that are kind of interesting. And, and I've always wondered, I don't know what's worse to expect to be um, shunned or to hope that you don't get shunned. And then covertly <laughs> you're gaslit and believing that you're not being shunned when you are, both of them are just, uh, can have a lot of impact on the psyche. It can. And, you know, the sad thing is, and I know this from working with ex Jehovah's Witnesses, but even in my own personal experience. Even though you know that that's the rule and you know that that is going to happen in your heart, you don't believe it. You're like, oh, they won't do that to me. Yeah. How could they you do know, that to me? We parents. love each other. They're not going to do that. My sister's like, nice. you know, it's family. And I would, I really, in my mind kind of thought, okay, the rest of the people in the congregation might do this, but are my parents really going to do it? You know, and I thought, I thought, okay, after six months or a year, or once they are convinced that I'm not coming back, they'll let up. That never happened. And then um, after I got married and I was pregnant, there was that secret part of me that said, oh, well, when I have children and it's their grandchildren, you know, they'll, they'll surely, <laughs> surely this will happen. And, you know, each milestone that I reached in my life, I kept thinking, um, maybe, and they have held fast. And that's so true for many of 
families and Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think that is one of the most devastating parts of leaving is losing that connection, losing that sense of family. And, and that really affects a lot of people's self-worth and the value of their self. And they question their own judgments. And that's why many Jehovah's Witnesses go back or end up with drug or alcohol abuse or commit suicide is because it is the toughest part of the shunning. What, what a sacrifice um, to make. I don't know why I have this double voice going on. What a sacrifice to make to leave the community and what a sacrifice to make to be a part of the community because on both ends you're suffering um, with losing those connections and that intimacy and the, and watching your kids grow and, and your grandkids, I, I can't even imagine, <laughs> but um, that sacrifice is the same. And I don't know about your religion. I know this isn't, it, this isn't the topic for today, but what I found out that sacrifice is love. When we associate sacrifice with love, um, then it, it makes it easier for us, whether or not we truly need to sacrifice <laughs> or whether it's this this ideology about sacrifice is love. And this is what we need to do to the Lord to prove that we are faithful servants of the Lord. And that sacrifice is love. And it so- also affects, um, it, I think it also affects your intimate relationships. And I think it's why a lot of women may fall into abusive relationships and, and accept that that's the way it is because there's sacrifice and control related in your mind to love and relationships. And I, you know, that's not our topic today, but yeah, I can see where those we could go down are, that rabbit hole yes, very easily, right? Really it's, quick and talk about even just that programming alone um, with, you know, Jesus on the cross and his sacrifice was right. the greatest act of love of all. And so we, we align with that idea that sacrifice is love and any religion can actually impo- embed that into the mind that I, my sacrifice because of my suffering and my long suffering and my, my willingness to put up with stuff I really don't need to put up with is a revelation reveals to God that I am a, a faithful and, and worthy servant. And it, that program alone is not healthy. No. And that's why it's so important. All these different indoctrinations that we have, it's why it's so important to learn the tools to release those things. Because, yes. you know, we could talk about a million different scenarios that the indoctrination that we went through affects our lives in so many ways until we learn how to undo that programming. Yes. Um, that's what we are here to talk about today. That is the thing. And maybe sacrifice will circle around and be one of the things that we can release. Sure. So tell, tell me like your five minute version of what is heart math? So heart math is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, heart math is a, a group in Cal- California who has been able to scientifically prove the connection between the heart and the brain and how that can help us rewire some of the neural pathways in our brains that cause us to react and respond to various things in our life because of programming. Um, What heart math teaches us is that we can ha- we have a resilience in our body and resilience is our ability to prepare for react to and recover from challenges that we face in our life every day and how we build that resilience is through something called heart brain coherence now over the last several years i think it was in 1991 that heart math was able to show that the heart has about 40,000 neurons, Mm -hmm. similar to the neurons that are in our cranial brain. And they operate very much like the cranial brain neurons. They feel and they remember. But they're different, right? They're they're separate from the brain. They're separate. They're independent of that brain. So when you have the ability to connect through emotion, the brain and the heart, 
and understand their relationship to each other, we can really help ourselves heal. We can help rewire trauma and release trauma. And it helps us choose a more positive, heart-centered emotional response to things. Because with continued practice of heart-brain coherence, you can raise the resilience level. It's like a battery that you have throughout the day. Your battery for your computer or your phone depletes its battery as you're using it. Well, throughout the day when we feel stress or we have cortisol that dumps into our body, we're depleting our energetic resilience. And so when we practice tools to help us bring ourselves back to a place of calm or ease and choose more heart-centered emotions, we kind of offset that dump of cortisol with replenishing some DHEA in our body. That's a pretty simplistic explanation because there's about, I don't know, 1,500 different chemicals that your body can choose. Um, so that's just an umbrella, big picture statement that we're choosing DHEA over the cortisol bite are the emotions that we're choosing. Um, I love listening to Greg Braden. And Greg Braden is now a certified heart math person. And I was oh, listening wow. to one of his um, talks the other day. And one of the things that he mentioned in this um, little seminar that he had was a lot of our responses and reactions to things are based on our programming from the ages of zero to five. And then beyond that, we have our own programming just by going through life and our responses to those things. And so many of us who experience trauma, but we don't face the trauma we don't go through the process of releasing the emotions and we just shove it down. By shoving it down, it doesn't go away. It's right. going so to it's, it gets stored in the material in our in our DNA, literally. Yes. So let me give you a picture of what when, what comes to mind when you're talking about this is we have this double helix of a DNA. And we open, we can open that pattern up and there's just like a little cell in there um, that we would call the latter part of the DNA. And we would take it out and we reobserve it. And maybe it's a, a past trauma, past memory or whatever. And we reframe it and we pretty much inject a different emotion behind it and replace it. And it completely reconstructs, recalibrates, reconfigures our genetic material. And in doing that, it actually expands our bandwidth because if our bandwidth is constantly in the process of um, dealing with all of our past trauma and um, the weight of our subconscious mind that's embedded with all of these, the, our past memories, um, then we only have so much bandwidth to work with, which is why, you know, three o'clock we have a big crash because right, right. Our, our brain is like, when we wake up, we're nice and refreshed, but by the three o'clock, all of our old patterns have all already been activated. So when we take even just one moment to zoom in on this one little experience, emotion, memory, um, or what I call micro trauma in the brain and in the mind and in, and in the genetic matter, we actually have the power to start reconstructing and reconfiguring our body, right. our mind, and our brain. Well, here's the thing that is very interesting to me is a lot of people who have been through trauma see counselors, they they go talk to people, whether it's an, a, an official counselor or a friend or a loved one, we talk through those things. And we deal with the cranial memory of the emotions that we feel and the trauma that we've been through. But if you recall what I said earlier about the heart having its own brain and its own memory, separate from the cranial brain, mm -hmm. those traumas are stored. Those emotional responses that we had are stored in the memory of the heart as well. So when we go through dealing with our hurt and our trauma and we only deal 
with the brain's reaction and we haven't dealt with the heart reaction, we only get part way there. So learning how to connect the brain and the heart so that both ends are healing from that past trauma, we are truly then able to rewire that programming. Um, because we have emotions that are either depleting emotions or rejuvenating emotions. Mm -hmm. There's no good or bad emotions because emotions are emotions. And no one is ever saying that you shouldn't feel all of the range of emotions, but it's when you get stuck in one of those depleting emotions that because causes us the most harm. So it's, uh, it's when you're unconsciously choosing, a, a, if I remember how Joe Dispenza explains it, you, you have an experience and, and you continue choosing that same emotion until it becomes a mood, until it becomes an attitude. And that is the frequency with which you're operating. It could be depression. It could be fear. It could be anxiety. And when, if I understand you right, <laughs> we're selecting our own chemistry. You can. When we're choosing or unconsciously choosing this emotion over and over and over again. And which I would imagine those, those more, what do you call them? If they're not, if they're, they're not, not good or, or bad, right. They're <laughs> rejuvenating or depleting. I love that. If we're choosing continuous depleting emotional um, choices, then it, it affects our chemistry and we have cortisol dump. Right. Makes complete now, sense to me. I have a lot of people say to me and and I posted something in your group of, about choosing happiness and that we can let's choose talk happiness, about that right That's let's talk about that fiery talk talk about. right so um it is a fact that humans are the only species on earth that has the ability to choose the emotions we can choose emotions consciously choose emotions. Dogs and cats and other animals, they all live in a world instinctually. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we instinctually respond to things too. And that all goes back to some of the programming from when we were little. However, it doesn't mean that just because we can choose to be happy, that we can choose to be joyful, it doesn't mean that that is what we're going to feel all the time, 100%, and no other emotion is going to be there. That's not yeah. realistic. And I don't even know that that's possible because part of the human experience is to feel to the feel range the of emotions yeah. that we have, right? And that's why I never, I never believe that emotions are good or bad. And heart math doesn't refer to emotions as good or bad. They're, they're either depleting or rejuvenating. And you're not immediately going to go from feeling anger or rage or fury or depression or anxiety over to joy and elation and happiness, you know, that it doesn't happen that way. It's just like when you shift a car and you're going to go from driving to reverse, you, you don't just jerk from one right into the other. There's that transition of neutral, right? And when you change the state of water and it's going to go from a liquid to a gas, right? It's going to, and that goes into, so it goes from a liquid to steam and then it boils, right? Or it goes from a liquid to a frozen ice cube. There's that transition period in between. It just doesn't go from boiling to ice cube. So part of the heart math's tools are to teach you how to sit with, in quiet, the emotions that you choose. And in some of the advanced courses that I, I like to teach people, because there's there's probably about seven different techniques that heart math uses, but there's basic uses and there's their advanced, how you implement them in your life. And one of the advanced tools tells you how you can sit with a situation that you have been programmed to respond a particular way that's a depleting emotion. And you can sit in quiet and think about that situation and how it made you feel in the past and reframe it and select another emotion that you'd like to feel and pull that emotion in and feel that emotion and breathe that emotion through your heart. And it helps to eventually start to reprogram 
the neural pathway. You start to create a new neural pathway. You're not forgetting the other one, but you're creating a new one. And just like a computer won't work until you put a program into it, our brains need to have a program. So when you delete a program or you want to update your software, you have to have something to replace it with if you want to see something different. So when we are upgrading ourselves from one program or software to version 2.3 instead of 1.0, you have to have something that you're replacing it with. You have to have an upgraded version to accept and program into your body. And so when I tell people it's, it, you can choose happiness, we can choose happiness. And it's a, and you can do things every day to set yourself up to feel those positive emotions. It doesn't mean that I don't start my morning off with all the tools and programs to help me be positive and I don't get in the car and someone cuts me off and I don't feel frustration or anger, but I'm able to bounce back. I'm able to bounce back to a more neutral emotion until such time that I can go plug back in and build up that resilience and charge my battery again. So again, you have that level of resilience. And the more you practice heart-centered breathing <clears throat> and heart-brain coherence, you raise that base level of resilience. So that when you have challenges in your life, it's like a Teflon field that you're building for yourself. And the challenge can come in, you can acknowledge it, and you can recover. Because the half-life of cortisol in your body is much longer than you think. And they have studies on the heart math um, website where they have had first responders uh, where heart um, and brain monitoring equipment that shows their heart rate because you can you can measure a lot of this stuff through heart rate variability which is the amount of time between the heartbeats <clears throat> and you can see the heart rate um, change when there's a stressful situation <clears throat> and then, excuse me, and then see when it goes back down. And the way that you know the half-life of that cortisol dump in the body is because you measure the heart rate before the incident. Then you see the heart rate go up Elevate. during the incident. <clears throat> and then when the incident is over, you look at their resting heart rate again. Now that initial resting heart rate is lower than the secondary resting heart rate. Because even though the incident is over, the cortisol that went into the body is keeping that body heart rate higher than it was before. So imagine a first responder who gets call after call. Police officer gets multiple calls throughout the day for domestic violence. Let's just use that because that's one of the hardest ones for them to respond to. They may have started out with a resting heart rate of 72 beats per minute. And then they go on the call and it goes up to 120, but then at resting, it might be at 80. Instead of 72, it might be at 80. Now they get the second call, right? So now their baseline is not 72 anymore, it's 80. And then it jumps up to that 120 and now the resting heart rate is maybe like 85. Hmm. So their yeah. heart rate continues to stay at an elevated pattern. Now they've taught them how to do, do heart math and how to bring themselves back to a state of calm or neutral. And then you follow them on those same kind of calls and their recovery is faster. And they're able to bring themselves back to an acceptable level until such time that they can go back and respond in a different manner and rebuild and recharge that battery. Okay. So okay. math, um, techniques and tools teach you how to use the, the ability to choose emotions while you're sitting in a state of calm and ease and just connect with your heart and your brain. You can improve your immune system, reduce stress. You can uh, activate some telomeres in your DNA that helps with anti-aging um, and all kinds of things um, that improve your health and, and your mental attitude. Yeah, when you become aware of how your body and your system works, you really can start shifting things intentionally. Um, but 
I want to bring that whole scenario that you just talked about with uh, the first responders. And I want to bring that into the experience that people who are exiting the church have. And I love the ex-Mormon community. I love that they're challenging the church. I love that they're exposing the things that are not right. But let me explain to you, based on what you just said, what happens in a person. And I've seen this over and over and over again, where they listen to a, a Mormon stories podcast. And what happens is their stress level starts to elevate because they start to get angry again about another injustice that that church has imposed upon them. And they start to remember because other people are sharing their stories about what injustice happened to them. Maybe some things that they didn't even think about before, and it starts to elevate their stress levels. And when they return back and the podcast is over, they might come back down, but not completely all the way down before they listen to another podcast. And now their, their, their stress levels are up again. And so it's about that year (laughs) that you're deconstructing, that you are under heavy stress because of what you're listening to and you're deconstructing. And it's not so much that, that the podcasts are bad. It's because you don't understand what you're doing to your mind by continuing to rewound yourself with the stories over and over, over again, you are not in a pattern of healing. When you're doing that, you're actually rewounding yourself. And the thing is, is your mind is still connected to the church and the past. And in that path, in that place, you cannot create another life. It's hard to even envision a future when you're constantly looping in the rewoundedness of what's happened to you in the church. And so I just, when you were talking about the first responders, I said, you know, that that's just like watching one Mormon story podcast after another, and you're elevating your cortisol levels. And this tool that you're going to explain a little bit more to us, um, at least how to apply it in our, our everyday life here, um, is something that you become conscious of and you, you use it as a tool for self-care and being able to process the emotions that come up because it's, it's one thing to listen to a Mormon stories podcast and get your emotions elevated, but they don't just go away. They don't dissolve. They embed back into the body. And now they're even more enraged and angry than they were before you listen to another story. That's going to, that validated your own um, trauma. Yes. And so if you can use this tool that Cindy's going to show us in just a minute, it's just one one of many. I mean, I I use many tools in my practice too, that are specifically there to be able to process past emotions. Um, You'll be able to intentionally say, you know, I don't want to be in this state. I'm ready to take control of my life and my mind and empower myself to redirect and refocus my life to create something new. And until you reach that pinnacle time, <laughs> you're, you're still a slave of the church. Exactly. And, you know, ex Jehovah's witnesses do the same thing. It's like, they just watch over and over. It's like, they have to continually validate to themselves that they made the right choice, that the Jehovah's witnesses look how horrible it is. And all you're doing is still staying anchored in those same emotions. Yes. And you're not choosing the new emotion. And once you decide to leave and you know that that's not the pattern um, of life that you want to follow, you need to consciously put your focus on where you want to be and not where you were, because you cannot move forward when you're still looking in the past. Right. It doesn't happen. So you have to have new tools. Now, one of the reasons that many of us leave both of our religions is we wanted freedom. Mm -hmm. We were told how to think, what to do, how to dress, what to eat, how, how to choose our mate, um, how we raise our children. Everything was dictated to us and we wanted freedom. We wanted to make choices for ourselves, but yet we're still looking at and reinforcing all of the things that we wanted to be free from we so wanted to ourselves in bondage businesses, right so so break the chains of the habits of looking at what we didn't want, want to be part of anymore and open yourselves up to new ways of thinking and new tools and techniques that put us in that 
choice of joy, choice of happiness, choice of freedom. And we can't do that by looking backwards. We need to use new tools. And the thing is, um, I liked how you mentioned that we have to focus on it because it has to become a daily pattern, Intentional. a daily habit, a daily routine, something that you choose to do. You can't just say, okay, well, I learned how to do this. And six weeks down the road, it's like, okay, I'm good. I don't need to do this anymore because then that, that battery for your cell phone won't stay charged if you don't keep plugging it in the wall. Yeah. And when yeah. you want to change your thinking and you want to rewire those neural pathways, it's a daily choice and it's a daily habit and it's a daily routine of using these positive tools and techniques from a variety of options. You know, heart math could just be one of the options that you use, but you have to practice it every day. It has to become a lifestyle if you want to let go of the past patterns. I love it. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. I can hear you. I have like a, a, ba a background noise coming on and I'm hoping that it won't show up in the recording. Um, so this is awesome information. I am so excited. I am here for this. This is why <laughs> I came <laughs> to the earth and incarnated in this body as a Mormon girl <laughs> and, and uh, deconstructed because I wanted to be able to watch and be a part of a world where we are no longer bound by trauma and we are no longer slaves to our conditioning that we can actually break free and intentionally restructure our mind and recalibrate our energy. And I, I'm here for it so much. So Cindy, tell us a little bit about what is a tool we can use? Like when, like, give, give us an example. We're remembering that um, we, we have no connection to our parents or our parents have com completely cut us off. Um, or we're remembering um, a bishop who told us something that influenced our life and put us in a really bad place, or we're remembering, you know, being uh, chastised and not being for me, it'd be not allowed to see my daughter's uh, marriage in the temple, you know, all kinds of things come up. So give us um, a tool so that if one of those memories comes up and we can witness ourself, um, engaging in this depleting emotion, what is something we can do? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I want everybody to remember that someone else's opinion of you only carries weight if you allow it. First and foremost, please remember that because you have to give someone enough power to have their opinion matter. I, love I that. don't really care what my next door neighbor's opinion of me is, but I may care what you think of me because I have allowed you to be in my inner circle. You are an important person to me. So what you say and think matters a little more to me. So first of all, we have to be very careful of who we're giving power to in our life and not allow everybody to be part of our inner circle because we are the sum of those closest to us and they say we are the sum of the five closest people to us so pay attention to those that you are allowing to be part of your inner circle be careful who you're giving your power to because you are worthy you are courageous you deserve all the happiness in the world. You are so worthy. So that, that's the first thing I would say to you. But <clears throat> when it comes to using a heart math tool, when you feel yourself feeling any kind of depleting emotion, heart-centered emotions are emotions like care, compassion, kindness, love, honor, courage, dignity. Those are all very powerful, rejuvenating emotions. Mm. Sadness, loss, mm. grief, um, anger, fury. 
rage, disappointment, those are all depleting emotions. So when we find ourselves in those emotions, it's okay to recognize why you feel that way or that you are feeling that way. Then try to identify why you're feeling that way. But then we want to bring ourselves out of those depleting emotions to that place of calm or ease. Because you're not going to pull yourself immediately from rage or fury or frustration or anger to a state of bliss without making that transition and coming to a place of calm or ease. So calm and so, ease is that's like neutral. You're it's putting, kind of like neutral. Or, or the put the neutral. brakes on so you can um, yes. make another adjustment with the gears. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like being in that neutral. So one of the things that is the foundational practice, it's the first thing that you learn when you are, are learning heart math is heart focused breathing. And heart focused breathing is going to help move you out of any of those depleting emotions into that neutral space of calmer ease. And so I'm going to walk you through what those steps are a little bit. We'll talk about it first. And it doesn't have to take long. Actually, what they have found in their studies is even doing this for periods of two minutes at a time can bring you into a state of calmer ease and stop the, the dump of cortisol into your body. So obviously we'd want to do it as long as you can several times a day, but when you start out, I tell my clients, even if you just do two minutes at a time throughout the day, and if you could build it up to longer throughout the day, that's fine. But when you feel these emotions, two minutes can make a difference for you. So the first thing that I ask people to do when they're new is to put their hand over their heart because when you put your hand over your heart, you're bringing the focus from your mind to the place of your body. Now, if, you, if you've ever seen like um, monks or, or shamans or people that pray all the time and do chanting, um, they usually wear a pendant a little longer than the one you have on. Yeah, because it has a massive right dragonfly, yeah. of course. <laughs> they have a pendant and they have that intentionally there because it's a bringing, helps them bring the focus of the mind to the heart. So when someone is new, I just say, hey, you might want to put your hand over your heart, bring your focus to your heart. Then I want you to imagine that you would be breathing in and out from your heart. Now, we all know that we breathe through our nose, so this is imagination, but imagine that you're breathing in and out from your heart, and just do that a little bit slower and a little bit deeper than you normally do, but at an easy rhythm. Now, there are some breathing techniques out there where they tell you to count to five and out, blow out until six and in until, you know, this box breathing, and that's all fine and good. That's just not the heart math way. They want you to breathe in and out a little slower and deeper than normal, but at an easy pace for you. And then once you fall into the rhythm that's comfortable for you, I want you to recall a time, a person, or a place where you felt a heart emotion of care, love, kindness, courage, honor, or dignity. And I want you to re-feel the emotion. Don't just think about, I want you to feel that emotion of love, care, compassion, or kindness. And continue to breathe. Oh, let's I got oh, tears, tears coming out and everything. That is it's working heart for focused me. focused breathing. Wow. Heart focused breathing. Now, one a little advanced tool for that is once you get into that state of feeling that emotion that you choose and you can feel it radiate, let it expand throughout your body. And then share that 
into the world. Because part of what heart math teaches us is that our emotions, because we are energetic beings and the emotions carry frequency out into that um, magnetic field, electromagnetic field. So whatever emotions we feel from our heart go out into the field and it affects the field of others and their fields affect ours. So yeah. when those emotions, whether they're depleting emotions or rejuvenating emotions, that's what we're sending out and well, it affects that's, the environment. That's that why that's why some people you're around, they just suck your energy right out because they've got a, a slew, a whole stew full of uh, depleting emotions going on and emotions do not have a container, right? They generate, you might be their origin of those emotions, but you, you, you don't get to control where those, how those emotions impact other people. And so that's why children, you're living in an emotional world and family dynamics where the emotions are just scattered everywhere and they're not quite sure how to get grounded and and they learn how to try and manage their life in that world and they come up with coping strategies that have to re be recalibrated when they're adults um, and they're not in those chaotic situations anymore um, but those emotions yeah being being responsible for those emotions is powerful it helps you respond to life and to mm -hmm. me, not letting your emotions just go run rampant and, and unsupervised actually makes you a more conscientious steward of the, of the world. <laughs> and right. to me, that's part of doing our inner hygiene every mm -hmm. day is calling forth all of those thoughts. And that's what I do in meditation and, and, and that effort to move into stillness is to be more consciously aware of the emotional pollution or the emotional radiance <laughs> right. sending out to the world. Well, and a lot of people have found, um, it was interesting when I was going through my certification with heart math, there was a lady who, um, I believe she lived in India and she said she had been meditating since she was a child because they learn how to do that from a young age there. And once she learned how to become heart brain coherent, she reached higher levels in meditation than she ever had before because she was starting out in her meditation with a heart centered emotion because uh, and, and i've had people ask well why is it so important to like connect with your heart why is that so important well because science has proven that the heart sends the signals to the brain and the brain responds with the answer but everything starts in the heart. A lot of people thought everything starts in the cranial brain and then it operates the body. It does operate the body. And they thought of the heart as just the pump for the circulatory system. They're learning now that the heart is more than just a pump, that it is actually the source of everything. Everything starts in the heart. So it's when you feel the emotion, the signal goes from the heart to the brain and then responds physiologically. So actually how it starts is the heart, the brain, the gut, the rest of the body. So connecting with your heart first and making sure that you are in a heart centered emotion, a heart centered state of being before you do or anything else, before you say anything else, right? Sometimes when you know that you're going to be talking to somebody and it's going to be challenging, or maybe you didn't expect for it to be challenging and all of a sudden it has become challenging, connect with your heart first and use that as the filter before you open your mouth. Just mm -hmm. take a second or two to connect to the heart and say, I want to understand what the person's intent is. What are they actually trying to say? Not as not what are the words that they're saying? And then how do I want to respond? I want to respond from a loving, heart-centered communication style. Mm. And when you connect with your heart first, because your body can only deal with one emotion at a time. When you choose the emotion that you want to respond with, 
you aren't going to wish that you didn't have word vomit that you can't clean up very easily. Yep. You're the driver. You're in the driver's seat and you're not just being a slave or at the mercy of your of your emotional center. And you're not coming from a place of conditioning. You're coming from a place of consciousness. You know, one one tool that I learned um, through HeartMath was a way to buy yourself a little bit of time while you're processing what they said was to say, if I heard you correctly, and then you can repeat back, you're Mm -hmm. repeating back to them to allow yourself the time to connect with your heart first. Because the beautiful thing about heart math is the more you learn it and the more you practice it, you can do that technique that I just showed you with your eyes open, no hand on your heart, because it becomes like muscle memory and you Mm -hmm. just know how to do it. My husband is a firefighter paramedic and I taught him heart math and now he is also certified in heart math. And one thing that he noticed is it helped him be clear and focused and more present when he is on a call, especially when it's a pediatric call, because those are the most chaotic calls. You have a parent who is hysterical. You have a small child in pain that can't tell you what's wrong. You have tiny little IV instruments that you're trying to put in a child who doesn't understand what's happening. And you have to be able to bring yourself to a state of calm and ease so that you have the clarity and focus and calm so that you can deal with this patient. And you can't be saying, hold on a minute, I'm gonna go over to the corner and I'm going to put my hand on my heart and do some do breathing. Some breaths. <laughs> yeah. Give, give me two minutes. You can he learned how to do this. And, and I tease him a lot because they started to call him the Zen paramedic because he, uh, he was different. able to handle it all. Be. Yeah. So when you practice this and you learn how to implement it in your everyday life, you can be the driver of how you react, how you respond, and how you recover from all kinds of situations. And you can learn how to unpackage that indoctrination and rewrite your own choice of responses to situations and still, instead of the way you were told you should respond to situations. I love this. So, so I want to take an experience that just happened to a member in our group this week. Um, she's in a mixed faith marriage. She's deconstructed her husband, not so much. And he's just informed her that he's not sure that he wants to stay married to her because it, it leaves him not um, being able to have an eternal marriage and he wants an eternal partner. And so she's like in her sixties and she's devastated. Um, so let's say I just got that news and my husband just broke it to me that he's not sure that he wants to stay in the relationship anymore because I've lost my testimony. And, you know, we all know the option isn't to go find it again, <laughs> because once right. you've deconstructed, that is not happening. Um, so like what, what could she do to be, to help her come back into that heart brain coherence? Um, It's really, sometimes it's challenging, right? I I don't want to oversimplify. It's true. I don't want to say, oh, just, you know, just breathe and it'll be better. Um, Although it's true, just breathe and it'll be better. It's not as simple, right? And sometimes you have to just say, I hear you. Because number one, people want to feel heard and acknowledged. And I understand that that's how you feel. I need some time to process this and we could revisit this later. I'd like to talk to you about it later, but I need a little bit of time to process this. And she's heard him. She's acknowledged that she's heard him. She didn't say or do anything in that moment because she's allowing herself or himself time to recenter herself. And then I would use some of the heart math tools and, and they have some advanced tools where you can do some mind mapping and you can do some intuitive work where you can sit 
um, after you've brought yourself into a state of coherence, you can ask for direction and guidance from your inner self because your heart is the seat of all your knowing. It's mm -hmm. intuitive. And, and they've been able to prove that through the HeartMath Institute. And you can sit and hear the answers from your heart on how you should approach things and what your next step should be. And you can get clarity and focus and go back and revisit that same conversation. Now, it doesn't mean he's going to change his mind necessarily. Right. It does, the situation is going to change, but you will have more clear, focused, heartfelt responses, and that you will find the inner strength and the inner courage and the serenity to approach the situation and follow your path and be loving because you realize that he is following his path may not be the path that you would choose for yourself, but it's the path that he's choosing. And so for love of yourself and love of that person, you can acknowledge that you may at this point in time have different paths. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing you say is that there are deeper tools, more tools to learn for that. That's to me that that's trauma. When you hear that, that news, you don't have, uh, most people don't have the capacity to process what's happening to them and they don't have the coping skills to manage it, which is the definition of trauma. <laughs> yes. And so and you usually need, you usually need a coach or yeah. um, a guide or a trusted person that you can go to that will hold your hand mm -hmm. utilizing tools and techniques to support you through that process because even someone who's trained and certified um we're still humans too exactly and, <laughs> you know and i gave you the example at the beginning of our conversation about not being able to see my grandmother sometimes i need to reach out to my friends or i need to reach out and talk to my spouse or my mentor, because even though I have these tools and I know how, you always need a community. It takes a village, right, of like-minded people. Yeah, because we are emotional beings and we have a range of emotions. And so let someone guide you. Let yeah. someone show you how these tools can be practically used in your life. And when you are facing a challenge, that's the best time to ask for someone, to be your coach, to be your mentor, to walk you through these tools in actual realistic application. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And we, we all have the opportunity to learn these tools from, from coaches. I know the tools that I teach are very much in alignment with what you teach. Um, and I, I think for a person in that level of trauma in that moment, to have, to be able to excuse himself from the conversation in a way that says, I love you. I honor you. I need some time and to go in and, and, and identify what emotions are coming up, abandonment, fear, my support, what's going to happen. I don't, I'm not lovable. I mean, and allow themselves to go through the full gamut of it. The worst thing you can do is to pretend like, Oh, that's fine. That's okay. I'm good. I can, I can deal with this and, and start that's bottling right. it all up inside. And what I'm hearing you say too, is that when you have a support group and you have somebody that you can trust that can hear and allow you to be heard and allow those emotions to be felt, um, that that's part of the process of being able to, to deal with those traumatic emotions right. and, and having a lot of tools in your toolbox, right? Yeah. I, it I, wasn't I'm, fair to teach, have you just teach one little tool, <laughs> right? Well, and for me, you know, I'm, I, I really am a, a firm believer in the heart math tools and techniques, but they're not the only tools and techniques I use with my clients, right? I use yeah. meditation and spiritual work and, and heart math and mindset. And you know, I, not that I'm trying to sell my program, but I came up with a program using the word heart as an acronym because I truly believe that it's a holistic approach mm -hmm. to um, undoing indoctrination. And so my program is called Thriving with Heart and heart is the acronym for health. H stands for health. Then there's personal health. There's professional health. There's relationship health. Um, the E stands for energy and emotions. A uh, stands for 
authenticity, because how do you show up? You have to show up as your authentic self or it's never going to work. So learning the process of authenticity. Art, R stands for relationships and routines, because you have to have routines in your mm -hmm. life in order to establish mm -hmm. and maintain those relationships. And then T is for trust, because you have to have trust. And the ribbon it. for all of that is gratitude. Mm -hmm. Because gratitude, love and gratitude are foundational for everything. And so um, having a lot of tools in your toolbox, along with a community and a mentor or a coach, are all the things that I think are essential for someone going through the process of blowing up that indoctrination. Yeah. and yeah. reconstructing a new life yeah yeah and then the main thing to me is awareness aware of the emotions and reframe and re recalibrate till you get to that place of gratitude it's like right now i feel shitty i've been betrayed how what is my journey back to gratitude i've got to reframe what's happening to me right now and yes. the stories that i'm telling around it so I can get to a place I truly, and I think you are too, <laughs> am grateful for my LDS heritage and being raised in a high demand religion because le learning so much on this other spectrum over here of suppression and control and um, really losing my identity and, and giving away my power has made me so thankful and grateful for restoring it and reclaiming it and understanding those dynamics that, that were embedded in me in the church has helped me to be aware of not using those strategies in my own life and to have the fortitude to say, I will not be the, the source of what controlled me and, and held me back. And my whole, my whole goal and my whole theme in my practice is liberating minds. And so I thank you for giving us this, this tool and teaching us more about heart math so that it can liberate our minds and That's can right. bring us back into that um, calm and peace and give us the strategies that will help us process this intense experience of deconstruction and reconstruction. Is there anything else you would like to share oh boy there's a lot that I would like I to know share. <laughs> I'm like wrapping this up and you and I can talk about a million things but um <laughs> you know I just want to tell your group that um I hope they find a place within themselves to embrace their past because that's what helped make them strong enough to move on and they've outgrown that situation. You know, there's, there's paths in our life and paths change. You know, it would be a boring path if everything was straight and expected. But open yourself up to change, be willing to change and be willing to understand that there are opportunities every time there's change. You can look at it as a loss. I've lost something. Or you can look at it as that was an experience I needed so that I'm ready for this new opportunity. Yeah, I, that's I needed <laughs> lessons. I needed to become stronger. I needed to have the resistance so that I could move into this next phase and be strong enough and wise enough and courageous enough. And trust me when I tell you, it won't be the last time that you have a choice to make or a new opportunity. So just like people who have empty nest syndrome or retirement regret, or you know they've moved into a new home or they have a new relationship, there's opportunities there. So don't look at what you're letting go as loss. Look at it as experience and wisdom. And you are now blossoming in to another phase of your life. And you have opportunities to use the tools and lessons from the past to move into this more experienced, strong, empowered life that you're creating for yourself. 
and whatever tools and techniques that you learn, practice them daily. Make it a habit to be joyful. Make it a habit to be heart-centered. Make it a habit to connect and be grounded to the earth. And open yourself up to new possibilities. I that love it. I love it. To me, the past was the arena to discover your power. It was the it was the platform that you used to see just how resilient and powerful you are. And so I thank you for sharing this with us. And I, I'm sure I'm going to have well, you, on, you. A, on again, and we will have um, an opportunity to address new things and maybe learn some new tools. Um, thank you, Cindy, You're for welcome. the fight that you gave to, you know, climb out of your, your little religious hole <laughs> and liberate yourself and learn the tools to help others. I really just love being associated with you. So thank you. Well, thank you. I feel the same. So thank you very much. Awesome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.